ونعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه جمعين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا أبده ورسوله and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh one of the matters that has concerned me considerably here in the western tech where i live is a greater loss of certain aspects of a religious practice of a islamic practice because of my seniority in age i've been able to watch this in fact i've been quite surprised at the extent to which certain very essential teachings uh, in the divine law, part of the Sharia, as we say, some of these teachings have been lost. It surprised me because I'd expected a greater sense of responsibility from all those in charge of our religious affairs to see that these things do not happen. A classic example of this is the recital of Ayatul Kursi after the Farul Salah. Every day, of, of course, uh, people, when they pray any of the Farul Salahs, they have to recite Ayatul Kursi after that Salah. There are also certain dhikrs like Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, and Allah Akbar that they have to recite. All these things have now been dropped. And the only thing that is done after the Farul Salah now is just a short dua or sometimes a very lengthy dua, whatever the case might be. This is a surprise because I do know from my understanding of religion and from my understanding of Islam, that we are losing an enormous amount of divine hasanat, of hasanat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it concerns me because I'm part of this community. And I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. If, for example, we talk, just let's say that we talk about a hundred mosques, just a hundred mosques. We are, in fact, over 170 mosques here in the Western Cape where we live. Let's just talk about a hundred of these mosques and say that in these hundred mosques or at a Juma, there is no recital of Aital Kursi. So that gives us a hundred Aital Kursi not recited on a particular Friday. If we multiply that by the number of weeks in the year, let's say we take 50, when it comes to almost half a million, almost half a million Ayatul Kursis that are not being recited in the Western Cape. If you take that for the year, for example, it comes to almost five million. And I've been very conservative in my calculations. What it means, in, in fact, that over a period of a year, there is an enormous loss of Hasanat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, of course, multiplies every good deed that we do by 10. So 5 million uh, ayatul kursis will become 50 million ayatul kursis. And can you imagine the amount of virtues or hasanat or divine good things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have sent down to us because of the recital of that verse can you imagine the enormous loss that this community is suffering because of what we are doing? And nobody seems very worried about this. The process continues and just continues. And nobody asks anymore, why is it that we do not recite Ayatul Kursi after the Farul Salah? Why is it that we are not reciting 33 Subhanallahs or 33 Alhamdulillahs or 33 Allah Akbar? We are a hadith on this. Why is it that this practice of our community, which we practice for a very, very, very long time, why is it that these practices are disappearing? What are the reasons for this? Nobody is examining this. My personal view, of course, is that because of the other kind of religious discourse that is coming to South Africa, this is a reason for it. But I'm not really investigated the matter, so I can't sort of confirm very definitely that it is that is the reason for this. Now, a few weeks ago, I was at a birthday party. And after we made some zikr, 
the lady of the house, the birthday girl, as we say, asked me to say a few words. And I explained to the uh, people who were sitting there that although it is her birthday, what is important for each one of us is to ask ourselves to what degree we have impacted on the lives of other people. Because my view is on this also, one's life is only worthwhile, or you only had a worthwhile life that you've lived, if during your lifetime you have impacted in a very positive way on the lives of other people. Can you imagine going through life 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, perhaps 70 years, and not impacting on anybody's life? Can you imagine that? What it would mean? That you've made no positive contribution to improvements in other people's lives. Your primary concern was just your own life and what happened in your own. Perhaps you've made a small contribution to the life of your children or the life of your wife, but definitely you've made no contribution to any other uh, lives. And it's a serious matter we have to think about. But just as we think very seriously about the loss of certain of the religious practices, we must also start thinking about the loss that is happening in this community of people having an impact on the life of others. We're also losing that. People are starting to become concerned only about themselves, their lives, and their achievements, or the lives and achievements of their children but definitely not other people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an a very positive thing for us. He says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Ku nu ansar Allah Be help us in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the ayah that all of us must memorize. Our Lord is telling us that He has a cause on the dunya. And this cause, of course, has to do with people's lives the activities that they indulge in, their behavior, or more specifically, their religious behavior. It has to do with that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we must be helpers in this cause. In other words, we must make a contribution, even in a small way, to the lives of other people. Imam Rumi, the very well-known Islamic poet, put it very dramatically. He said, do not look for us in the graveyards, but look for us in the hearts of those people whose lives you have impacted upon. I want to repeat this because this is a wonderful statement by this man. He said, do not look for us in the graveyards, and go to the graveyards to look for us. Look for us in the hearts of people whose lives you have impacted upon. Find people who have found our contributions to their life significant, who will tell us that that person or those people have touched our lives in some positive way. Surely that is the greatest du'a that you can make. The greatest du'a, for example, that a person who teaches children to salaw, to recite Quran, the greatest du'a is when they practice those things. There's no reason for them to raise their hands in du'a, or no reason for them to go to the graveyard and raise their hands in du'a. The practice of those salahs, or the practice of the recital of the Qur'an, is already a serious supplication for the person who had taught them. And so when Imam Rumi said this, it's a reminder to all of us. And when, when I read this, I thought of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu I thought of the fact that he is buried in Medina. And it's extremely good, of course, for us to go to his grave and to greet him and those who are lying in his vicinity, or a little bit away from him. It's very good for us to do that. We've been ordered by Islam to greet Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu But how wonderful is it not to come into the company of people in which his memory resides in their hearts? How wonderful isn't that? You come to people and they talk about him. His memory is in their heart. Their love for him just explodes when they talk about him. When they recite salawat upon him, it's a major connection with him. 
And so although many of us can't reach Madina, but many of us, or most of us, or all of us, can reach people in whose hearts the memory of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So Imam Rumi was right in a way. He was right. He wanted to remind us to examine the hearts of people who cherish the impact that other people have had on their hearts. This is very important for us to understand. And I'm mentioning this very deliberately for you because of uh, what Imam Rumi had said. But you see, there's something else that's associated with all this. When we look at the long history of religious practice and thought, from the beginning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent these first messages onto the dunya and prophets, they say there was 124,000 of them over the long period of human history. Now, 123,999, they left their footprints in the sands of the history of the community in which they functioned. Each one of them. Wherever they were, in whatever part of the world, if they were messengers, for example, they had been instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver the message. And when they delivered the message, of course, it was always of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they delivered the message, they planted a very important footprint in the history of the community to which they had been sent. The final one, of course, with the most dramatic footprint was Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he came, his footprint in the history of mankind was absolutely dramatic. When he, the contribution that he had made, when I use the word footprint, here I'm referring to contribution that he had made to the lives of others. How he had impacted on the lives of other people. And this is important for us to understand. And so when he came, and as I'm using this, this, this comparison, his footprint that he planted in the history of humanity was probably the most dramatic that it ever happened. And we must see it like this. We must have a look at his contribution by studying his history. And look how his contribution, the dramatic impact that contribution had on the lives of people. Even if you go back just to the cave, the first time when he sat there in the cave and Jibreel alayhi salam came to him. And Jibreel alayhi salam told him, Ikra, read. That word read, and later the statement, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, those words launched past the greatest intellectual and spiritual advancement of mankind. Think about it. When Jibreel told Nabi Muhammad al read, he put into operation a movement in that cave of the major intellectual and spiritual advancement that was to take place in mankind. Can you now imagine the impact that Jibreel had, that I'm really referring to Nabi Muhammad, that Nabi Muhammad had on the lives of people when he heard the word Ikra? And can you imagine the massive impact he had on the lives of people when he changed the direction of their religious beliefs? They had to believe in the one God, La ilaha illa. And in his messengership, Muhammad Rasulullah. And when they accepted that, he started there in Mecca and later on in Medina, a movement amongst people to strive for major intellectual achievements. And the Muslims came down at that, those generations, the first few generations, considered as the greatest generations in Islam. As a, as, and amongst them, there was a movement for major intellectual achievements. In all different branches of knowledge, they went to research. With the banner of Islam in their hands, they opened major doors to different aspects of human knowledge. So much, so much. I do not know whether in the long course of human history has ever been such a contribution as made by the Muslims of that period. But you see, they didn't isolate the intellectuality. They didn't isolate that. They also brought into play, with regard to the intellectuality, major spiritual achievements. 
And so the great intellectuals of the early Muslim period were also very pious people, both men and women, both genders. They achieved intellectually in different branches of human knowledge and they achieved spiritually in different branches of the sciences of the after. This was the king of humanity, bringing together these two aspects of human life. Kunu Ansar Allah, be helpless in the cause of Allah. Look at the way they helped. How they helped that cause. They helped that cause by opening major doors of human knowledge. And they helped that cause by opening major doors of spirituality. And so we look at a man like Imam Ghazali, for example. Perhaps one of the greatest figures ever in Islam. A great intellectual. A man that has achieved considerably intellectually. And also one of our greatest spiritual figures. And this, you see, is important about Islam during the first few generations. It's a bringing together of these two aspects of human life, impacting on human life in this particular way, changing the direction of human behavior, the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this particular way, bringing together the, inter the intellectual aspect of human life and the spiritual aspect of human life. And so one can mention numerous, numerous people who we talk about today made major contributions to the Renaissance in Europe, made major contributions to the further development of different disciplines. But at the same time, these people never forgot their God. They cherished his memory, tried to remember him at all possible times, and became great spiritual figures. When we look today, when I look there at those centuries, and I bring my eyes right down to Cape Town, I feel ashamed. It's almost as if the son has died. Where is the striving for intellectual achievements among us? We have just come out, we saw in a season when large numbers of Muslims their contribution to the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in satin clothing, painted faces, their children and their daughters jump up and down in the streets of Cape Town to the strumming of guitars. It's a shame that during the first few centuries of Islam, people strove to achieve in knowledge and to achieve in the science of the year after. Today, here in Cape Town, where I live, People achieve by wearing satin clothing, painting their faces black, eating little sticks on the, uh, on the, in, the, in the street, singing all kinds of stupid little songs, and they think they're making contribution to whatever they think they're making contribution to. This brings shame, but it also brings pain. What has happened to us? What has happened to the footprints that our forefathers had left? Every mosque we built was a footprint. Every contribution that was made by our, by our forefathers, those are footprints. The first three centuries of Islam, the Muslims were like stars, shining bright in the firmament of knowledge and spirituality. Here we are, I live today, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I assume it is very similar. We are wasting our time on matters which are making no contribution to our intellectual growth or to our spiritual growth. Thousands of Muslims doing this in the streets of Cape Town. Some in satin and some in suits. All the same. And they say this is our tradition. Part of our Islamic culture here in Cape Town. Thousands of people come from all over the world to watch these spectacles. And many of us more serious with regard to our religion, sit in our homes with our chins on our chest, feeling the shame and the pain of this, and thinking deeply of how we used to be. You know how I envy those Muslims of the first few generations. Just to have been amongst them, for example, to have listened to their conversations, and to have listened to the grounds that God had given them. It must have been wonderful to live in those centuries. As people strove, strove in laboratories and libraries, whatever you might call it, 
building up massive libraries for Muslims, massive domes of, of tomes, I think they were, of learning. And they mending their Lord in the middle of the night, sighing for spirituality. And Allah subhanahu giving them major stations because of their achievements. It is difficult today here in Cape Town to mention the name even of one person who's combined those two aspects of human behavior in their lives, the intellectual and the spiritual. Those who have gone in for the intellectual ignore the spiritual. Those who have gone in for the spiritual find the intellectual too burdensome. I'm at the end of here, here now with you. I want us all to think very deeply about the kinds of contributions we can make to other people's lives. And how we can change those lives, those lives for the better. And how we can make ourselves and others better Muslims. Because that is the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we do that, we are obeying the instruction from Him. He says that we must work in His cause. And we remember the words of Imam Rumi, the great Islamic poet. He had said, do not look for us in the graveyard. Look for us in the hearts of those people on whose lives we have impacted. What a beautiful son. And we must seriously start thinking about our religious losses. And each one of us, in small ways and in bigger ways, must work strongly wherever we are to stop this kind of thing, to remind those who are leading prayers there is such a thing as an idol kus. And there are hadith on that. And if you want that, I will give it to you. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance and for help in what we are, do what we are doing. Subhanahu rabbika, rabbil izzati amma yasifun, salamun wa mursaleen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alam.